good morning. Let's begin our service by singing hymn number 413. Let us sing of Easter gladness that rejoices every day, sing of hope and faith uplifted. Love has rolled the stone away. Lo, the promise and fulfillment. Lo, the man whom God hath made, seen in glory of an Easter, crowned with light that cannot fade. Hymn number 413. scriptural this morning will be given by Imogene from Australia. The Bible, John. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. If any man serve me, let him follow me. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, 
But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Let us now have a moment of silent prayer and follow with the Lord's Prayer and its spiritual interpretation as given in the Christian Science textbook. Our Father, which art in heaven, our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious, hallowed be thy name, adorable one, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom is come, thou art ever present. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Enable us to know, as in heaven, so on earth, God is omnipotent, supreme. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us grace for today. Feed the famished affections. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And love is reflected in love. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. And God leadeth us not into temptation, but delivereth us from sin, disease, and death. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For God is infinite, all power, all life, truth, love, over all and all. Let's now sing hymn number 275. Praise now, creative mind, maker of earth and heaven. Glory and power to him belong. 
joy of the sun in skies, strength where the hills arise. So let us praise with joy and song. Hymn number 275. Welcome to the Sunday morning service, the Easter service of the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. We begin every Sunday morning here at 10 a.m. with our roundtable discussion, which is very practical teaching in very practical Christian science. And we had another really good one this morning. So if you missed it, or if you'd like to listen again, you can find it on our website, plainfieldcs.com, and it will also be available on our YouTube channel. We have a Sunday school for children that meets at 11 a.m., and that Sunday school has its own teleconference number, and many of our Sunday school students particularly those who don't live in the area, participate on the telephone by calling in. So if you have a child of Sunday school age and don't live in the area, please call us. We'll give you the number and would be very happy to welcome your child to our Sunday school. And every Wednesday evening at 8.15, we have a testimony meeting where you can hear testimonies of healings and lives literally saved through the study and practice of Christian science. And at all of our meetings and services, we have a nursery for infants and toddlers. So you can bring the whole family. Our next Bible study session will be Saturday, May 14. So... Check our website for the study questions, and if you want to get a little head start, 
start studying for the next Bible study. That'll be in a few weeks, May 14th. And mark your calendars, 10 a.m. And we have been printing and mailing. The latest edition of Forum Highlights has been printed and mailed to subscribers. On our website, we have the most beautiful poem. If you haven't read it, you have to read it. Easter Morn by Mary Baker Eddy. Beautiful poem. And there's also, in addition to that, there's also a very good, um, very helpful article by Martha Wilcox that I wanted to recommend entitled, Our Practice Governed by Our Viewpoint. Very practical and very instructive and very helpful. Everyone is welcome here. And that includes all of you who are listening and participating from around the world. Today, now we will have the reading of a testimony from miscellaneous writings, which attests to the healing power obtained by studying the Christian Science textbook. And that reading will be given this morning by Karen from California. Page 406. Number one. A lady friend who was found to have a severe attack of dysentery was assured that such attacks could be cured without medicine and advised to take no more. She was more than astonished at the result, for in less than an hour, all pain and other symptoms of the trouble ceased and she felt perfectly well the next day. Number two, while she was visiting relatives in the country, an infant of theirs was attacked severely with croup and appeared to be on the verge of suffocation, giving its parents much alarm. The infant was taken in the arms of the lady, in 30 minutes was completely relieved, went to sleep, and awoke in good health the next morning. Number three, the mother of this child was subsequently attacked with a scrofulous swelling on the neck just under the ear, which was very painful and disfiguring. The side of the face also being badly swollen. It was feared that this would develop into and undergo the usual phenomena of abscess as other similar swellings had done previously. She had great faith in the metaphysical treatment because of the experience which she had had with her baby and wrote a letter describing her case. This was immediately answered and absent treatment was begun. In 24 hours after receipt of the letter to the astonishment of herself and family, the tumor had entirely disappeared. There was not a trace of it left. Although the day before, it was fully as large as a hen's egg, red and tender to the touch. These instances are only a few of the many cures which have been performed in this way and they are mentioned simply to show what good work may be done by any earnest, conscientious person who has gained by reading my works the proper understanding of the principle of Christian science. What a wonderful field for enlightenment and profit lies open to those who seek after truth. Alas, that the feet of so few enter it. The lesson sermon for this morning can be found on page six of the Independent Christian Science Quarterly. Subject, Doctrine of Atonement. 
The golden text is from John. I and my Father are one, Christ Jesus. The responsive reading is from John. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. Fairly from Maryland will now read. The Holy Bible, Matthew. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He hath seen me, hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father? and the Father in me. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away, where they crucified him. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, 
and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She says unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Romans. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Carol will now read. I will read correlative passages from the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, by Mary Baker Eddy. Christ illustrates the coincidence or spiritual agreement between God and man in his image. Throughout all generations, both before and after the Christian era, the Christ, as the spiritual idea, the reflection of God, has come with some measure of power and grace to all prepared to receive Christ, truth. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and the prophets caught glorious glimpses of the Messiah, or Christ, which baptized these seers in the divine nature, the essence of love. The divine image, idea, or Christ was, is, and ever will be inseparable from the divine principle, God. Jesus referred to this unity of his spiritual identity thus, Before Abraham was, I am. I and my Father are one. My Father is greater than I. The one Spirit includes all identities. <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth, taught and demonstrated man's oneness with the Father, and for this we owe him endless homage. His mission was both individual and collective. He did life's work aright, not only in justice to himself, but in mercy to mortals, to show them how to do theirs, but not to do it for them, nor to relieve them of a single responsibility. The atonement of Christ reconciles man to God, not God to man. For the divine principle of Christ is God. And how can God propitiate himself? Christ is truth, which reaches no higher than itself. The fountain can rise no higher than its source. Christ, truth, could conciliate no nature above his own, derived from the eternal love. It was therefore Christ's purpose to reconcile man to God, not God to man. Jesus aided in reconciling man to God, by giving man a truer sense of love, 
the divine principle of Jesus' teachings. And this truer sense of love redeems man from the law of matter, sin, and death by the law of spirit, the law of divine love. Jesus suffered for our sins not to annul the divine sentence for an individual's sin, but because sin brings inevitable suffering. Jesus experienced few of the pleasures of the physical senses, but his sufferings were the fruits of other people's sins, not of his own. The eternal Christ his spiritual selfhood, never suffered. Jesus mapped out the path for others. He unveiled the Christ, the spiritual idea of divine love. To those buried in the belief of sin and self, living only for pleasure or for the gratification of the senses, he said in substance, Having eyes, ye see not, and having ears, ye hear not, lest ye should understand and be converted, and I might heal you. He taught that the material senses shut out truth and its healing power. The efficacy of the crucifixion lay in the practical affection and goodness it demonstrated for mankind. The truth had been lived among men, but until they saw that it enabled their master to triumph over the grave, his own disciples could not admit such an event to be possible. After the resurrection, even the unbelieving Thomas was forced to acknowledge how complete was the great proof of truth and love. Every pang of repentance and suffering, every effort for reform, every good thought and deed will help us to understand Jesus' atonement for sin and aid its efficacy. But if the sinner continues to pray and repent, sin and be sorry, he has little part in the atonement, in the at one with God, for he lacks the practical repentance which reforms the heart and enables man to do the will of wisdom. The belief of life in matter sins at every step. It incurs divine displeasure and would kill Jesus that it might be rid of troublesome truth. Material beliefs would slay the spiritual idea whenever and wherever it appears. Though error hides behind a lie and excuses guilt, error cannot forever be concealed. Truth, through her eternal laws, unveils error. Truth causes sin to betray itself and sets upon error the mark of the beast. Even the disposition to excuse guilt or to conceal it is punished. The avoidance of justice and the denial of truth tend to perpetuate sin, invoke crime jeopardize self-control, and mock divine mercy. The atonement requires constant self-immolation on the sinner's part, that God's wrath should be vented upon his beloved Son is divinely unnatural. Such a theory is man-made. The atonement is a hard problem in theology, but its scientific explanation is that suffering is an error of sinful sense, which truth destroys, and that eventually both sin and suffering 
will fall at the feet of everlasting love. Absorbed in material selfhood, we discern and reflect but faintly the substance of life or mind. The denial of material selfhood aids the discernment of man's spiritual and eternal individuality and destroys the erroneous knowledge gained from matter or through what are termed the material senses. When we fully understand our relation to the divine, we can have no other mind but his, no other love, wisdom, or truth, no other sense of life, and no consciousness of the existence of matter or error. All that really exists is the divine mind and its idea, and in this mind, the entire being is found harmonious and eternal. The straight and narrow way is to see and acknowledge this fact, yield to this power, and follow the leadings of truth. Our Master fully and finally demonstrated divine science in his victory over death and the grave. Jesus' deed was for the enlightenment of men and for the salvation of the whole world from sin, sickness, and death. Paul writes, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the seeming death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Three days after his bodily burial, he talked with his disciples. The persecutors had failed to hide immortal truth and love in a sepulcher. Glory be to God and peace to the struggling hearts. Christ hath rolled away the stone from the door of human hope and faith and through the revelation and demonstration of life in God, hath elevated them to possible at one with the spiritual idea of man and his divine principle, love. Let us now have a moment of silent prayer for our world.
Let's now sing hymn number 370. We are hid with Christ forever in the Father's holy plan. In this pure eternal union, we behold the perfect man. And we know that sin can never overthrow the sacred rod of dominion over evil. We are hid with Christ in God. Hymn number 370. Demonstration of a 
Let's now sing hymn number 263. Only God can bring us gladness. Only God can give us peace. Joys are vain that end in sadness. Joy divine shall never cease. Mid the shade of want and sorrow, undisturbed our hearts rejoice. Patient, wait the brighter morrow. Faithful, Heed the Father's voice. Hymn number 263.
from the Christian Science textbook, The Scientific Statement of Being, and the correlative passages from 1 John 3rd chapter. There is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. All is infinite mind, and its infinite manifestation, for God is all in all. God is, spirit is immortal truth. Matter is mortal error. Spirit is the real and eternal. Matter is the unreal and temporal. Spirit is God, and man is his image and likeness. Therefore, man is not material. He is spiritual. First John. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart, into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Amen. <laughs> 